welcome. Uh, we got people pouring in here. So we'll give a couple of seconds for folks to join. Uh, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the executive director of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, which is a joint initiative between the Yale School of Management and the Yale School of the Environment. Um, thrilled to have the first in a, a series of author's talks, which we're going to do uh, in 2021 this year. Um, and, you know, this sort of the start of this is in 2012. Uh, we had an author invited who came to campus, Vincent Stanley, who you see there, uh, who's the director um, of philosophy at Patagonia uh, and a resident fellow at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment now. And I think in two days, Vincent probably had, I actually went through the agenda, we put him through like eight or nine meetings. Um, and he came and he talked and he was launching this book, The Responsible Company. And one of the students, a guy named John Lovner, who got to sit in about three of the meetings, um, came up to me at the third time that he was hearing Vincent speak. And he said, you know, you really need to form a relationship with that guy. Every time I hear him talk, I learn something new. Um, and that's certainly the way we felt uh, throughout those two days. And so after it, we were fortunate and lucky enough to be able to create um, a connection with Vincent and the center. Uh, and so for the past eight years now, uh, we've been collaborating and engaging in different ways. Um, and Vincent is going to be the centerpiece and kind of lead of these authors talks. Um, and with the first one today, uh, we're incredibly jazzed to be able to feature one of the folks from the community here at Yale. Um, uh, Marissa King and Vincent will do more of the introduction, but uh, her book, Social Chemistry, uh, launches today, um, and you can find it in a number of different places. Heather Fitzgerald from our team just popped into the chat where you can uh, find a great way to, to get the book. Um, uh, really exploring um, some of the kind of connections like we just I was just describing uh, of how we connected with Vincent. Um, and uh, this series is put together because we really see the need um, to pause, reflect and learn from people like Vincent and Marissa who've taken such time, effort, energy um, to synthesize incredibly complex topics. Like let's stay away from hot takes and get down to really thinking and listening to people in conversation who've thought incredibly deeply about something. Um, and so we hope that you enjoy it. This is the first of a series, as I mentioned. Um, questions throughout uh, the first part of this will be a conversation between Vincent and Marissa. Uh, after that, we'll take your questions through the Q&A function. So if you have one throughout the, the conversation, please put it into the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of Zoom. I'm sure folks are well familiar with that now. Uh, and we'll be pushing those to Vincent so he can ask them to Marissa. Um, the floor is yours, Vincent, and thank you for all the time that you spend uh, collaborating and engaging with us uh, at the center. Yeah, well, well thank you, Stuart. And uh, thanks to Heather and Amy and the uh, CBay staff. Uh, this has been a big part of my life for the past eight years. But I'm really happy um, to join Marissa King today. Uh, uh, we were speaking yesterday just briefly, and there's just so much in this book um, in social chemistry that uh, so many de departure points and so many questions I wanna ask uh, that I'm uh, afraid an hour won't do us justice, but uh, let's go ahead. And I'd, I'd like to introduce, Marissa is uh, the, uh, the professor of organizational behavior at uh, Yale SOM, uh, holds her uh, PhD from uh, Columbia. And um, I'm very interested, I was reading a little bit and I'm very interested in uh, how Marissa uh, came to the work. And there was a quote about um, Marissa, you appearing, um, I think you were a student at Reed at the, uh, uh, at the Seattle demonstrations in 1999 and observing uh, this enormous protest that had developed quite spontaneously and wondering uh, how social movements uh, arise uh, from these informal networks of people. And um, I think that what the, 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 the quote I, I, from you that really resonates with me is questions about collective dynamics. How do you get individuals to come together create larger scale social change. And uh, you, you, you mentioned that from that 
time in 1999. That is how you became interested in understanding how social networks work. Um, and this resonates with me because I think that the, what, what I see from the Patagonia, my, the perspective of my own work at Patagonia is that we have reached a point of what Pope Francis calls one single crisis that has two faces, that is both social and environmental, that we've, we're in a decade that we all know is uh, existentially critical, not only to the survival of the human race, but also to the health of the other species on the planet. And we also see that networks are either going to take us down or networks are going to save us because um, one of the capacities that we've gained over the past 50 years uh, as a species is the ability to create large international networks, often informal, to address problems that reach deep bottlenecks within the existing structures. So an example would be that people in Miami now are working closely on the issue of sea level rise with people in Rotterdam, with people in Dakar. They don't really care what the state legislature of Florida has to say about sea level rise. They're more concerned with engaging with other people who are involved in, in the same issues. So I guess um, my first question to you would be working on this book, um, and from your initial concerns in 1999, when you went to the Seattle protests, what, what did you learn working on the book about how individuals get together to create larger social change? Yeah, it was such a powerful moment for me to see in that protest just how diverse groups came together. So you had, you know, enormous posters, you had people from unions, you had environmentalists, you had people really focused on social issues and social equity and social justice. And in that moment, I saw the possibility of what can happen and create just large scale social change when individuals can come together as a collectivity. And throughout my work, I've been profoundly interested in what happens and how do we get large scale social change from individual actions. And what I've learned is that that really boils down to networks. And if you want to solve large scale social problems, it, the answer is the same if you're trying to look at how you can leverage your own individual network for personal gain, right? Whether it's to find a job, to get a promotion, to increase work engagement, the answer is the same. You actually have to understand how networks work. And to begin to understand that, it's helpful to go back in time to the 1950s and the work of Stanley Milgram. So this is the same guy who did the shock experiments, but this is a much more benign experiment. And what he found, which has become really popularized, is that we're all connected and that six degrees of separation can separate us all. And that is profoundly important if we think about complex social problems. But what's interesting is when that work was reinvigorated in the 2000s, when I was doing my doctoral work at Columbia University, Duncan Watts and his lab began to redo these same experiments to see how much we we're separated. And the answer actually was the same. Despite rapid changes in technology, an increased ability to communicate, there were still six degrees of separation. But what was profoundly, to me, it's amazing, right? Like I feel like, the, you know, physics has their Higgs boson particle, and this, they boiled it down to essential elements of social structure. And that we can really deduce social interaction to three simple structures. And that for me has this sort of same flavor of like the God social particle, because once you can start to understand that and imagine this world in this way, whether you're trying to leverage large scale social change, bring forth change in your company, or actually just change your personal life, for me, the ability to see the world in this way changed. And so what Duncan Watson, his collaborators found is that we're separated by six degrees of separation because there's a fundamental underlying social structure. This is true in social life, but we also see the same social structure when you look at neural networks, when you look at ant colonies. So there's this demarcator that makes the world small. And why the world is small is that all networks can be boiled down to three fundamental social structures. You have conveners, 
you have brokers, and you have expansionists. So within convening networks, friends are friends with one another. There's a dense, tight social structure. This makes there, there's a lot of trust. There's a lot of buy-in. It's easy to convey ideas and get buy-in within these networks. But they're essentially right tight clusters of people and they're separated from everyone else. So in this, the case that you were giving, right, you, the environmental movement is typically separate from social justice movements. Mm -hmm. But those are often brought together by brokers. And brokers, both by personality and predisposition, but also brokers can be created, they tend to bridge social worlds. And in bridging those social worlds, they create the possible the possibility for movements, but they also bring forth innovation and creativity. And so fundamentally, you have a structure of a lot of separate social worlds that are connected between brokers. And the third piece of this are expansionists. Expansions have extraordinarily long, large networks. There's a property within social networks in general that they tend to have long tails. So while most of us know around 600 people, expansionists will know 60,000 people. They have extraordinarily large networks. And what they bring into that system is a bit of randomness or chaos. And so if you start to think about this world in this way, right, that we have movements or we have organizations or we have communities that are densely connected and they are consistently brought together by brokers who bring social structure, but the expansionists bring shortcuts. That's the randomness or the beauty of networks. Mm -hmm. And you need all three of those pieces to make the world small. And the same is true if you're trying to catalyze large scale social change, you need to figure out who are your conveners, who are your brokers, who are your expansionists, and they all need to be brought in a purposeful concerted way into the mix. And the thing that I find so interesting is networks are made out of people, right? They don't just exist in the ether, uh, right? It's, they're, our, our networks are our relationships. But people are so reluctant to examine their own personal networks. And this makes a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons. Our social relationships are in many ways our most sacred, um, our most sacred thing that we have, right? So the idea of being intentional or purposeful about them is often really off-putting. But if you want to bring about large-scale social transformation, you have to understand networks and you have to understand your own network and the role you play in being able to help bring about that change. Interesting. I, um, one of the things I noted early on in the book is you referred to the kind of cellular function of networks um, and referred to uh, examples being uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or the Communist Party, which were built on uh, these, these sort of semi uh, or, or autonomously acting uh, groups that then expanded. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a pleasure. I mean, I think if you think about what holds those groups together, like that there's something amazingly powerful about having independent autonomous organizations that are oftentimes guided by the underlying set of principles and practices but they're not formally organized. So if we think about how most organizations are designed, right? They're kind of like, there's a box at the top, there are lines between them and there's a hierarchy. And that hierarchy really, it creates possibility for urgent action, but it also impedes a lot of what needs to happen if we actually want to transform society. And to transform society, you need independent groups acting autonomously that are guided by underlying principles and vision. That that's really where identity plays such an important role and it holds people together and it gets a sense of commitment and buy-in in a way that's next to impossible if you don't allow people to self-select into a group, which is what humans just naturally do. But you can't just sort of have, if we just have a bunch of autonomous groups, which is in some ways, I think what's happened actually within society is we're seeing this increased level of polarization because you have a lot of autonomous groups that aren't talking together. So while the autonomy of those independent groups is so important and that's really emblematic of what, what convening networks are, they have trust, they have buy-in, they have reciprocity and they have identity, but those autonomous groups have to be connected to one another in some way. And that's why having brokers or the people who can move between them easily is so important. Yeah. You know, another, you just mentioned reciprocity and trust. And one of the things that struck me was that the, 
vitality of a network relies more than in, in a kind of hierarchical organizational structure, the vitality of a network relies on reciprocity. That's what keeps it going. And reciprocity relies on trust. I thought that was a very interesting continuum. Yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, the norm of reciprocity is really what is the fundamental property that is guiding all social relationships, you know, and it's in a, that's built through repeated interactions, right, that it's trust is, I think, a developed property in the sense that if I connect with you, and then you reciprocate that relationship gains depth over time. And one of the things that really drives and fuels that is the ability to engage in mutual self disclosure. So you show me a little bit about who you are and what you value, and then I reciprocate. And based on that, over time, we're able to develop trust and a beneficial relationship. Um, but it really has to be reciprocal, right? And that I think is one of the things that uh, too oftentimes people think of that in a way that is there's a tit for tat. So I'll do for you and then you do for me. But in reality, it needs to be turned on its head in the sense that I'll do for you without any expectation of reciprocity. And then when you do reciprocate, that is really where trust starts to come from. That's a very interesting uh, observation. And it, 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 uh, you, you had also mentioned in the book that there was a um, kind of a, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, the feeling of a community and connection and a financial reward, that these things often uh, are felt in opposite ways. And if I, I was just reading an, uh, a long article about John Berger, who at the end of his last 20 years of his life lived in this small village in France, and they were all, uh, he was the only writer, the rest were peasants. And there was this reluctance, they never charged each other for any work. There was always an expectation, though, that somewhere down the line there would be a kind of return, and there was an embarrassment about money. But in the society that we live in, where uh, the transaction, the, the financial tr transactions are so significant, how does that play out in relation to the sense of community or connection to a particular group? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in the work world today is how do you square these two competing really orientations. And there's a great work in psychology that shows that they really are fundamentally orthogonal. If you ask people what they value most and then you map them, community is at the polar opposite of instrumentality or money. The same is true that we know that the people get most joy right out of intimate interactions, but also in one-on-one -on -one social interactions. And if you ask people simply like, what do they plan to do in the next 24 hours? But then you prime them with the idea simply of money um, they're much less likely to subsequently report that they're actually going to spend time connecting with other people. And so this idea of instrumentality and social connection or communality are really orthogonal values. And one of the th challenges I think within workplaces is how do you square those two? So how is, you know, a different way of putting it that's much simpler is how do we actually have friends at work? And yeah. some of that is actually keeping those spheres separate. So thinking about what needs do we actually need to get out of the workplace versus what needs should we be fulfilling in other domains. But some organizations, and I think Patagonia has done an extraordinary job of doing this, is that if everybody's guided by a higher principle or a higher moral commitment to something that transcends both of those, then you can get communality, you can get this sense of communality and pur shared purpose and shared mission, even if there's money being made because if there's a higher purpose that's driving that effort. Yeah, and, and I, I think that bears out in my own experience that the, the work teams become like those cells that we're talking about. They become like an AA meeting or like a communist party cell in which you're, um, you're committed to shared work um, that is well outside what you think you're gonna get paid for or promoted for. Um, it's a different way of living. And, and I think you, your work is so exemplary in this regard, right? That what is it, you, like the idea of being a director of philosophy, like that idea is so powerful. And if more organizations and even more individuals getting back to thinking about AA and other organizations like that, if you're living by a different set of principles, 
right? Then it's much easier to be guided in a common purpose and not having to rely on social structures that oftentimes simply don't serve us when they're really transactional. It's a very, it's a difficult way to live. Right. And when they are transactional, the, um, that, that sense of reciprocity and, and trust does not get engaged. So there's a level of resistance, I think, um, to, to most organizational work that disappears when people feel connected to it. If, if I wanna see people at Patagonia work very quickly to get something done in an impossible amount of time, it will always be something that they believe in personally. That's beautiful. And the quality of work is fundamentally different. Like just yeah. like to be super clear, right? Like I, I understand there's like a place that we have to have transactional relationships and right, like that that's just how the world works. And some of those transactional relationships I do think come with trust, right? Like I'll invite someone into my house mm -hmm. to repair an appliance and I trust that they're not gonna steal me from me and I pay them and they get the job done and then they leave. And I think what's important is just being clear about what our motives are and what's happening and the, those transactional relationships is the same with dating, right? Like if I say we're going on a date and it's clear, that's fine. It's if I'm friends with someone and they think we're going on a date that things get really, really confusing. And that I think is true in work world, right? That we can have transactional relationships. It's just that we need to be clear that those are transactional and not model them. And I think what happens too often at work is that our sense of our own sense of identity, our own sense of purpose and what drives us is mixed with the transactional. And when that is that lack of clarity, I think that really results in the problems. Yeah. There was a, 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 a kind of related question. Um, you mentioned about that the, the quality of a network uh, changes over time. And that it's often the healthiest the first six months and, or in groups that have worked together for years. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think make net, makes networks thrive or fall apart for a time and, and how, how they get revived? Oh, that's really interesting. Um... I mean, I think that when we think about the quality of interactions, it's helpful to short, just separate out both the short and the long term, because the quality. Like we've talked a little bit about structure of interactions, these three basic forms, and those are the enduring traces of our social interactions. But what we know is the quality of our interactions, in the sense to which we feel connected with one another, is actually determined in the moment on a very, very short temporal scale. And there's lots of demarcators of this, and it really boils down simply to how present we are with one another, how well we're listening to one another, the extent to which we're looking one another in the eye and engaging on a very, very basic interactional level in the moment. And that really is actually what determines the quality of our interactions in a given moment. But if we think over the long term, like what impedes those, right? What impedes that? And there are two issues I think that are the biggest impediments. One is actually simply distraction. And that can re and I think that that's something that so many people in workplaces or mm. in particular are struggling with right now is right. that we're trying to stay connected in ways that we're not built to do. And we're really simply distracted. My favorite example of this is there, um, there's a study that demonstrates just how easily it is to be distracted and not able to connect by they um, randomly assign people to either be using their phones or not using their phones and be walking down the street. And as they were doing that, they had um, a clown on a unicycle ride by. <laughs> And only one in four people on their phone noticed the unicycling clown, right? So if you no. think about, right, like if you think about what, what you're missing. Yeah. <laughs> and there are other studies that demonstrate this also. There's a beautiful study called the Parable of the Good Samaritan. And what this was done at Princeton Theological Seminary. And what they were trying to ascertain is why do people, some people stop for help and why do some not? And they yeah. ask some people, right, to review the parable of the Good Samaritan. They were seminarians and they were told that they were going to be applying for a job. Others were asked to prepare another sermon on a biblical passage. And then they walked by an actor who was in physical need of, pain, of help, actually in pain. And what they found is that when they looked at who stopped, it didn't matter whether or not they were asked to remember the parable of the Good Samaritan or think about a different sermon. What mattered is if they were told to hurry or not. Mm. 
I think that in both of these, it, we as humans, we deeply want to connect with one another, but we're driven to distraction and we're often in a hurry. And that's what really keeps us apart, even though we so desperately want to be together. And over the long term, those slights, right, and incidents, they aggregate and can really turn relationships negative for no other reason than we're too busy or too much in a hurry to give them the attention that they deserve. That's really interesting. Um, I hadn't I hadn't heard that story, um, and it's interesting that it was sem seminarians, and it didn't matter uh, that it was it was just this question of being in a hurry. Um, there's another kind of interesting question for you uh, that that, uh, that really struck me. When you talked about uh, blame hmm. assigned in groups and blameworthiness, and I think there was uh, you mentioned so the CEOs were asked uh, how many uh, of the problems that were caused, how many could be assigned specific, you know, were, were due to the blame on particularly individuals or groups, and, and it was like the CEOs would say two to five percent, but when you talked about um, with how people regarded um, uh, what actually happened in terms of people being held to account. It was like 70% uh, of the problems were assigned blame. And how does this relate to the function of networks and how they can function? What, what, what kind of atmosphere does this create or is there, and is there a way to work around this? Yeah, I mean, what we know is within organizations is one of the most powerful ways of creating a high functioning organization is to create something called psychological safety. And the idea of psychological safety is this sense of blameworthiness. Um, and we know from a structural perspective that psychological safety is most likely to happen in these dense convening groups, right? Where friends are friends with one another or colleagues work together quite closely. The downside of this is it's also that they tend to be people who are homogenous with respect to background. Right. So within those structures, naturally, there tends to be higher le levels of psychological safety. And this was developed, the idea was initially developed by Amy Edmondson. And like she says, I wish I wouldn't have called it psychological safety in retrospect. I wish I would have called it radical candor. And mm. that type of network or relationship, right, where people are working together repeatedly and quite closely, there tends to be a high level of trust in that. So even if you bring someone new in, that nat networks actually naturally close on themselves. So because of one pr principle of this is just psychological balance, right? So the adage that if a friend of a friend tends to become a friend. So we actually tend to evolve in this structure. But what's really powerful is that it's difficult to create, but it's really quick to dissolve. And what we know is that within organizations, we've been talking a lot about positive relationships, but negative relationships have an outsized effect on our networks in particular. If you look at studies of networks, and this is, we often refer to this as negative ties, that it's literally close to two to 5% of ties are negative ties, but they capture a disproportionate part of our attention. And some of this is evolutionary, right? That we're taught to pay attention to things that can harm us or are likely to be a threat um, just to survive. So we actually devote much more of our attentional focus on things that are negative, but it's also just human nature, right? If someone, crit you can give me a hundred compliments <laughs> and one critique and I'm gonna focus on the critique. But what that means is when we're thinking about designing systems, we need, they naturally actually evolve in this way that has a lot of pro the potential for radical candor and a lot of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. But one drop of negativity can dissipate that amazingly quickly, and it's extremely difficult to repair it. And so the idea, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about creating a thriving organization, is to focus first and foremost on creating an, an environment that really has a lot of trust, a lot of reciprocity, uh, and the potential for radical candor. But you have to go to great lengths to protect it. Because it, it's the adage, like, one bad apple can spoil the brunch is absolutely mm -hmm. true. Some of that is thinking about very, very carefully about hiring. 
but also thinking about how do we establish norms and principles that we all buy into as a group. And then you can create a culture where there's a self-reinforcing property um, and hold each other mutually accountable. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, 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 I think that we need to expand this idea of radical candor to include the ways in which we deal with, uh, I think you referred to assholes, jerks, and pessimists, uh, uh, who in, in one meeting it can change the tenor of the group uh, uh, from from the beginning to the end of the meeting, and then change the tenor of the group going forward. So, so it becomes important to create norms and principles that we can call people to account for, in, in, in ways in which people are shy and people don't call each other out for uh, being negative or for uh, um, uh, not acting in the interests of 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 of, of the group dynamic. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is also trying to approach that with empathy, because a lot of times people are acting in that way for reasons because they themselves actually are hurt. There may be something going on in their lives and, and being able to engage in perspective taking and reaching out, before, again, getting back to not assigning blame, right, but yeah. getting back to a question of asking with like true curiosity, like, or is everything all right? Is there anything we can do, right? It's very easy to want to exclude. And like, you know, working with MBA students, like they, they are so quick to be like, oh, let's fire them. And it's like, no, let's ask them how they're doing and what they need. Um, yeah. And that reorient reorientation is so incredibly helpful because when you ostracize someone from a group, it not only hurts that person, but it has long enduring consequences for the group, but inviting them back in it has a power, it sends a very powerful signal about what you care about. And sometimes that's not possible, but most yeah. of the time people aren't acting like jerks because they're really jerks. It's because they have something else going on that need, and they need help. Or they need to have something modeled for them uh, that illustrates a, a more productive way to, to behave with the others. Yeah, and I think for me that that was actually one of the most powerful parts of writing this book, actually. I'm not trained as a social psychologist by training, right? Like I study social systems, but I, and I myself have struggled. I hopefully wasn't a jerk, but I've definitely struggled with a lot of social anxiety. And what I realized right, is a lot of the way, like it can all be learned, right? Social intelligence is very much a learned skill. And by learning some basic, like fundamental rules of social human interaction that I wasn't given the playbook to somewhere, somewhere along the way, right? it's been extraordinarily helpful for me, both in reducing that anxiety, which is really critical to allowing me to engage with other people. And I think that that's often the case is that oftentimes people can seem disengaged or like they're acting out. And it's actually simply that they don't know how they should be acting. Yeah. yeah. And there was, a, this is not a, a major part of the book, but very early on, you, meant, you mentioned it, it. The classic problem for people who go to parties and don't know what to do with themselves is, you, the, the people are drawn to dyads. So you look for the odd number crowd, the three and the five and the, or the one, and then you, and then you, you complete the circle. Th those kinds of uh, uh, tips about uh, social anxiety, I certainly wish I had had um, uh, at any time in my life. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you're always the life of the party, Vincent. I doubt that you needed them. But so much of it actually does boil down to confidence. So the odd number group, it can be, I, I found enormously helpful because it mainly more than anything, it makes me feel more confident. I'm like, all right, I know where I'm going. I don't need to run away. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the questions, there was another, um, one of the things I thought was actually um, appropriate for particularly appropriate for a business school and, and also for the role of business in society for, for what for what business can provide um, that uh, and NGOs and, and, and governments might not necessarily provide. As you mentioned that offices are less racially segregated than churches and schools, that there is there is a kind of function to um, and the transactional quality of businesses and the way people are arranged together since they're not making choices about who they're going to be with um, that provides some um, uh, 
provide some hope for us. Schools, churches, and voluntary organizations are more segregated than offices are. And it may also explain the res some of the response of the business community to Black Lives Matter and to the events over the summer. I was just wondering if you had any further thoughts on that. Yeah, it, this is one of the pieces that I find so powerful. And because it, it, it one, it reveals so much of just how human interaction work. The reason why religious organizations, voluntary groups and neighborhoods are so racially segregated is because we select into them. And when we form groups naturally on our own, we tend to be guided by the principle, uh, which is known formally as homophily, but the tendency of like to affiliate with like. So we choose to interact with people who look like us and already think like us, um, in part because it feels safe and it feels secure. There's like less worry. Um, and so when we're left to our own devices, we form self-segregating groups that are pretty homogenous. And what's so powerful about organizations in the workplace in particular is it tends to be far more diverse than any other type of organization that we interact with on a daily basis. But what's even more powerful than that is that in the workplace, we can actually create networks. We can devise and tinker with social structure in a way that we can't, right? Like I can't to move my neighbor from next door, which I would if I could, hopefully they're not on, right? But I can't tinker with what interactions happen in my neighborhood. But at work, we can actually design organizations. We can design interaction. That one first allows the possibility for more diverse workplaces because we're not self-selecting into them. But it also creates the possibility for a greater level in, of inclusion. If we think about how do we take that diversity and create interactions that could allow for not just diversity, but also inclusion. And there's a lot of potential within organizations to start to solve a societal problems. If we think about loneliness, if we think about mental health, organizations in workplaces in particular, when I say organizations, I'm referring to workplaces, have the yeah. potential to change our interactions in a way that can help solve those problems in a way that other domains of social life can't. Interesting. Do, um, we, you mentioned earlier the, the kind of the breakdown between conveners and brokers and expansionists. Would it be the role of a broker um, in the network to, kind of reach outside the, uh, the uh, homophilic uh, associations and put different people together? Yeah, so if we think about, right, that these self-selecting structures and networks left unmanaged tend to create these convening-like structures that friends mm -hmm. are friends with one another and they tend to be pretty homogenous. And the, it's the brokers that connect between them. And someone ends, can end up as a broker for lots of different reasons. Some of it is personality and predisposition. People often think your network type is most likely to be determined by how extroverted or introverted you are. We actually know that, our, that personality plays a tiny role. So extroversion or introversion only explain around 10% of variance in network type. But of all personality characteristics, the one that is the biggest predictor of what type of network you have is actually called something called high self or low self monitoring, which is really the extent to which you're a chameleon. So high self monitors um, tend to be good at doing things like giving impromptu speeches at parties on topics they know little about, right? That they are chameleons and they can in many ways speak to different groups and interact with gr gr different groups in a way that they're able to frame issues and problems in, in a way that speaks to both. Which, so yeah. it's really brokers that are connecting these groups. But what's a really also important to realize is that organizations can create brokers. Much of our network type and much of our network signature is actually determined by where we spend our time and how we live our lives. So brokers tend to have very unusual career paths. And if organizations want to create brokers, right, if they're trying to create more inclusion, if they're trying to create innovation or creativity comes through brokers, then you can take steps to start to devise career paths or rotation programs that allow people to develop this type of network. And that benefits the organization, but it also benefits the broker themselves. Gotcha. And then can you, can you, what is the difference between the role of the the, of the broker to make the connections between these disparate groups of people and the role of the expansionist in creating the random 
or the, the, the introducing the random or the chaotic element that uh, serves the vitality. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so brokers tend to connect social worlds that are pretty socially proximate, right? So you could think about a broker would be within an organization. They would be the one who would connect engineering and um, let's say the sales department, right? Mm -hmm. So they're bridging paths between groups that are pretty socially proximate. And what's so powerful about expansionists is they have extraordinarily large networks, right? My favorite example of this is David Rockefeller, who at the time of mm -hmm. his death, he collected, he, every person he met, he put on a nine by, an index card. And those index cards set end to end by the time of his death would have stretched more uh, miles and miles and miles. And what's interesting there is there creates the possibility for random social interaction. So if you map networks and you look at expansionists, they'll have just this outer layer of people who would never talk to each other, right? That they may, you know, they are the person who would know someone in, I don't know, Dar es Salaam, and they would know someone, you know, in Idaho City, right? And it's that, right? So it's not that they're brokering groups, but they have connections to a large, large number of individuals. And that's where this possibility of people who would never normally bump into each other because they're not necessarily in groups, that they're just extraordinarily large and disconnected, that that's where that this, these shortcuts and networks or the magic really of bringing the world, making the world small comes from in expansionist networks. And I think one, one question I want to ask you before we, we go and take questions from uh, the audience. By the way, I, I have to say, if, if you have a clock, my computer has this new capacity to not tell me the time unless I make my window disappear, which... So. It is 4.40. All right. Okay. So the last question I, I would like to ask is, I'm, what... I'm wondering what you learned from writing the book that has been useful to you or seemed especially resonant to you in the time of COVID during this last year, which has been one of, of probably an intensification of both loneliness for most people um, um, and, and also an intensification of networks uh, because we're all doing a lot of work by by Zoom and we're all uh, connecting to uh, people that we would ordinarily travel to see. So anything that's come up that that, that you think, oh my gosh, that was, uh, that was especially a positive to what's happened this year. Yeah, I mean, it's, I along with my college, colleague, Balish Kozak and Nicholas Kaplan, we've actually studied what's happened to people's networks during COVID. And we mapped hundreds of individuals' networks a year in June prior to COVID, and then looked at them in June this year after and we were really in the midst of social lockdown. And what we found are a couple of different things. One of the biggest changes that we've seen in people's networks is that the outer ring of acquaintances has shrunk pretty profoundly. So the outer ring of acquaintances has shrunk by close to 17%, which is equivalent to around 250 people. But almost all of that shrinkage was due to the reduction in the size of men's networks. So men's networks shrunk by more than 30%, but women's networks have hardly shrank at all during COVID. And I think that that's a powerful illustration of one of the misconceptions about how networks work and we think about them. Um, it's not, right? Women aren't spending more time <laughs> maintaining their social networks. Like, women are incredibly strapped for time between having to manage their home life and their work life, right? And you've seen the downside consequences of this across the board. And what I think this finding really highlights is it's not that investing more time makes you have a more resilient network. It's thinking about how you connect. And the difference really boils down to how men and women maintain their social relationships. So women tend to maintain their social relationships through conversation versus men tend to do activities together, right? So they go bowling together, they go fishing together, they go skiing together, they do whatever they do together, but they don't really talk that much. And if we want to think about what that means, right? It's not that we necessarily need to spend more time developing our network. It's we need to think more carefully about how we do that. And the second piece of this, of what we've seen, 
during COVID, I think is illustrative in that regard. So during COVID, the other piece of this is our nat networks have naturally turned inward. That's part of the reason that we're seeing a shrinkage is that we're focusing more of our time and attention on our core connections, our closest family, our closest friends. And what we found in our work is the people who have fared best during COVID in terms of loneliness in particular, have five or more strong connections. People who have less than that have really, really suffered and have increased loneliness, even if you control for how much how lonely they were before. Yeah. So it really is this fundamental core that provides emotional and social support. And I think for me, this has been an important reflection on thinking about who do I really need mm -hmm. and making sure that I maintain and strengthen those connections and give them the attention that they deserve. And it's hard, right? Because for like I live in a I have kids, I have a husband, right? Like there are a lot of people in my house, but on a minute to minute basis, and particularly during this time, I may not have actually been connecting with them at the depth that I need. And I think that they need in order to get through this difficult time. And for people who don't right, have a lot of people in their house, the other piece of this that I think is really important to realize is there is extraordinary value in your existing relationships. The idea now especially shouldn't be like think, trying to meet new people, but that yeah. trust stays in our relationships for a, a very long time. So you can get a, a profound impact and well-being both for yourself and the other person by reaching out to someone you may have not spoken to or two to three years. And that reconnection, mm -hmm. I think, is the gift really and the mm -hmm. silver lining of this really, really difficult time. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I, I read a little bit about reconnection in the book and its possibilities, especially when people are having hard times when they've been fired, etc. So um, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting insight. It, it also connects back, I think that when we want to make things real, we tend to make them smaller. I mean, you refer to that and we tend to break them down so that we actually feel or experience rather than just think about them. And, and, and that may also be related to why five or more close connections would be important to us in this time. And then before opening up to questions, I just want to read this, the last, the last paragraph of the book, which I think kind of sums up what we've been talking about. Um, in, in combination, brokers, expansionists, and conveners make the world small. They strike a beautiful balance between order and randomness. This is how brains and ecosystems and ant colonies work. And despite the differences in personality and preferences of conveners, expansionists, and uh, brokers, they all contribute to creating a brilliant, vibrant human order. So I want to thank you for writing this book and for doing the 20 years of work I'm sure that led to it. But let's uh, let's open it up now. I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the chat box. Um, one like, first question is very interesting. Where does the person who wants to bring about social change fit into the three kinds, conveners, brokers, or expansionists? It's the I think this line that you just read sums it up perfectly, that you need all three. Yeah. And that oftentimes I think the person who wants to bring about social change oftentimes will default to a convening network. That I, people with very strong ideologies um, and strong values actually tend to do really well and thrive with like-minded people who get them they have a lot of trust, a lot of buy-in and a lot of commitment. But the truth is that you need all three, right? You need that that strong convening network where there's shared values and shared goals. But if you want to address a complex social problem like climate change or inequality, you have to really address them all. And so you need the brokers that can 
broker between those groups and help them speak to one another. And I think that that was one of the profound things that happened during Black Lives Matter is you started to hear people mm -hmm. who were focused on environmental justice to start to talk to people in Black Lives Matter, right? It's the same thing that happened in 1999 in Seattle that was so powerful. But you also need expansionists. Like you need people with a platform. You need people with influence. But expansionists can't do it alone. Um, and I think that that's one of the misconceptions is it is it an extraordinarily large network that will help but in reality you need all three that's interesting i, I think it's one of the uh, the one percent movement or the 99 percent movement okay. rather that if you talk to veterans of zakaro park they'll tell you that um they felt the need to uh, move on to uh, make have have different kinds of discussions than uh, the ones that were just going on between themselves in the, in the park. Um, thinking about how to make the abstract concrete, what can people do to harness the power of networks? Say if one was wanted to scale sustainability in the world through their networks, what might be some steps you'd recommend for engaging our audiences and institutions to have real impact? I think the first piece is starting to understand what your own network looks like in your own personal strings. And I think that's where the oftentimes people hit resistance is that there is an idea of like thinking about Right, like they don't want to look at their own relationships because it can oftentimes feel morally off-putting. But the reality is, you have to understand what type of network you have because it's your greatest asset. That if we want change, that it's going to take. Right, it takes a movement. So if I know, for instance, that I'm a convener, there's extraordinary strength in that network. But I, if I want to reach out and expand that movement, right? Like if I want, you know, I primarily tend to think about social issues and social justice. If I want to, for that to happen, right? I need to be able to find a way to connect with you, Vincent, or with CBay, right? We need that those connections and that happens through brokers. So figuring out what type of network you have and then figuring out who can you put get on board for allies and being really clear about who's doing what and what those roles are that's how you start to create a movement and those connections don't just happen naturally right that those alliances are really really difficult to maintain you spent a lot of time at yale trying to create these interdisciplinary cross-disciplinary alliances to promote social good and despite how many brilliant scientists there are at Yale. If you don't understand the human element and how to maintain those connections and build them, like we, 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 we won't, we, our default is to go back into our own small yeah. little world and talk, right? And to talk to people who already think like us. Have you had any um, experience when you've been having these discussions? And so, say for most, so the terms were new to me uh, conveners, brokers, and expansionists. Um, and if I were as a, a, in part of a network, how would that correspond to, say, if I were in a, uh, say, if I'm I'm in the city of Miami and I'm trying to <laughs> work on, uh, I'm trying to work on sea level rise and I'm trying to work with others and that, how, how do I think about conveners, brokers, and expansionists in relation to the needs of the network that I. How, how do I go about finding those folks who are saying or establishing the norm within the group? This is this is what we need, and this is this is Ed Ed over here and Jane over here, and 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 they're doing performing that function. Yeah, I think one of the starting points is to realize that your network is a form of capital, right? Like social capital is a form of capital, and being really thoughtful about what you bring to the table. And oftentimes, when we're trying to do some type of work or trying to do some type of good, we're oftentimes focused on our human cap capital or expertise and what we can bring to the table. But thinking about getting back to your example, um, if who do you know in Miami? And it may not be actually someone in Miami. It may, it's most likely actually someone who's working on a similar issue in a different geographic constituency that can create that connection for you. And the power I think really realizes in how much people wanna connect and wanna help 
and being willing to leverage those connections. And one of the most powerful ways to actually forge a connection is simply to ask for help. It gives the other person a sense of mastery. It gives them a sense of purpose. And so realizing people want to help and just asking simply, who do you know? It's easy to identify expansionists. They know tons of people. When you think of someone who top of mind, it's most likely an expansionist. Conveners are deeply embedded. Um, so if you can find one of them, you can find them all. And so it's starting to think in this way, um, it starts to make it much more tractable. Okay. The very common question um, is, and I, is the bad apple analogy um, about how, how, uh, how does it work with the idea of radical candor when people may need to express negative thoughts in groups and organizations? Uh, how does that get reframed in some way to be productive rather than negative? Yeah, I, that's a really important question. And because the idea isn't that you never say something negative, right? We need to be able to ask questions and we need to be able to give advice. And a lot of that is thinking about gets back to this issue of is an action blameworthy? Are you blaming someone? Are you approaching a question to try to understand what what happened to make a situation negative? So the first question is simply to ask with an open mind, what, so what happened, um, but be open to the possibility and then recognize there are all sorts of reasons that things go wrong. Most of the time, it's actually that someone didn't have the resources, they didn't have the support, they didn't have the information they needed. And so starting to address those questions through open and honest, but kind, right, conversation. And so it's really important to say that it doesn't, there, there has to be accountability and there has to be an opportunity for advice and feedback but it can be done in ways that aren't inducing blame. And that's really where things start to go really wrong. Right. So directness, but kindness. So. And curiosity. And curiosity. That's <laughs> very, yeah. Curiosity, I and think, is the key there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how would you, how would one start building your thinking into teaching your, uh, learners, what can I teach my five-year-old uh, about related to your ideas? How would you boil it down for her? Oh, that's beautiful. I, one of my favorite um, stories in the book, and if I if I had one like human interaction superpower to give people, it would actually be listening. And I think it's so rare that we're truly listened to and heard. It's an incredible gift. Mm -hmm. And how this boils down back to the five-year-old is Ralph Deckels, who is really known as the father of listening and did early studies on this. When he looked at who is a good listener, and it depends how we define listener, I'll give you that, but who is a good listener? It turned out that he found first graders, so not five-year-olds, but first graders were actually the best listeners of all. And the reason that that was true gets back to this idea of curiosity is that they listen with an open mind. And so I think actually in many ways, it's that five-year-olds have so much to teach us because they're able to be present and they're able to be open in a way that as adults, I think that we tend to close down and we have to relearn. So I would flip the question and ask, what can you learn from your five-year-old instead <laughs> of what can you teach them? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I remember the, uh, a section from the book too, where, where you talked about Martina Abravanich. Uh, who, who at, at the Met stood, I, I saw her, she was, was on, at the, on a wall, sort of silent, but would engage people's gaze. And they were so uh, moved, people were moved to tears by having this, uh, it, it, it wasn't actually, they, she was listening, but not, not to words. And I know that we're approaching the end of our hour together. And I think that that's such a powerful example because it shows the, one of her messages was just how starved we are for human contact. And I think that that is one of the, we're at a moment where that's more true than ever, um, that we all deeply need social connection. And what I hope that people will take away from our conversation today is whether it's an hour of conversing with you or just reaching out to someone, right, that you may not have seen in a few years, right, that there's extraordinary value for both for you, but also for the possibility for creating social change. It already exists within your network. And the key is really actually figuring out how to tap into that. And many of the 
actions that you can do to are most effective are really quite simple. You know, ask for help, give someone, or simply take the time to thank someone for the role that they've had in your life and in shaping your thoughts. So um, I'm particularly grateful and thankful for the opportunity to have a conversation with you today, Vincent. I've learned so much from speaking with you. Well, I've learned so much from speaking. Thank you so much for your work. And I think this is a, a good place to end. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, it, 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 out in the ether there for your engagement and for your questions.